Welcome to the Life Writing Podcast, where married authors and screenwriters Stephen Barnes and Tanan Reeve do talk about writing during stressful times, breaking into Hollywood, and balancing life. Every week, we'll share more tips on how to build a better life while you create your dream projects. Even if it's only at the rate of one sentence a day. Life writing is the application of the tools of writing to life and the tools of life to your writing. Woohoo! We're back! Hey, everybody! I just noticed something when was I was that? listening to you at the intro. You have a damn sexy voice. Ah, well, back at I mean, a damn sexy voice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me try to stay focused. Because we have a very, I mean, I say every week it's a very special episode, but you know I'm all about Halloween and October, and this is our can't miss horror movies for Halloween episode. So I am super, super psyched about that one. Great. Talk about horror movies. So we can we can trade off. You can talk about one. I can talk about well, one. Well, first we have to have our our lead in to our segment on uh, great horror movies that you may or may not have seen or haven't seen in a long time that you need to watch this Halloween. <laughs> okay, that was all just the build up to that. Now I, you know I was trying to do a scream. Oh, here's my scream. There you go. Now that totally sounds real. For, for me, um, I'm I guess several you lead us off. Lead several us off. movies are movies that's like what movie scared me the most? Yes. You know, and so there are a few movies, and then there are a couple on here. There's, there's one of the movies on my list is the most extreme movie I've ever seen that I can still consider to be a good film. Mm. Um, you know, oh, so there's and then there's one that is not a horror film traditionally but horrified me because of some social contextual stuff oh boy so you know that sounds meaty so i do think we should trade off and by yes the way, we can trade this, off this list is not like going up to number one or anything like that we're not saying one is no. better than the other one we're saying these are movies that scare the crap out of us and you need to watch them either or watch them again so why don't you start darling okay well i'm going to start with um one of the movies that scared me the most um and then i'm going to couple that with the reason why that movie is is important in a number of different ways i think that it's probable that there are two movies that gave me the strongest fear response that I've ever that I've ever experienced in a movie theater. One was the Night of the Living Dead, which I Classic. was I was in from the from the time that movie started until it ended. I I've had very very few movies that have ever had me feeling as uncomfortable where I was looking around the movie. I saw this maybe, I don't know how old I was. I must have been 17, maybe. But I was looking around the movie theater trying to figure out where the exits were in case the people around me in the theater turned into zombies and came after me. I mean, I was it, I was on the edge of freaking out. That's and how that's I just... felt all during 2020 in our neighborhood where the, uh, <laughs> the MAGA flag was across the street. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But... Go on. The movie that is important in a different way that also gave me a similar fear response was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And the interesting thing about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is that from the time the title itself was so critical to the success of that film because nobody had ever titled a film something quite like that before that I That's could think true. of. And the first movie. image in the movie is a rotting corpse, and the first sound in the movie is a narrator talking about the terrible things that were going to happen to these kids. The movie itself is not that violent. I mean, there, not that much happens in the movie in terms of Listen. direct bloody violence. Well, but you are absolutely, you're absolutely in, an up, in a state of upset from the very, very beginning. And what's important about that movie historically is that when Ridley Scott was going to make Dan O'Bannon's movie, uh, the script, Alien, um, Dan O'Bannon said, if you want to understand horror, you need to see this. 
and took him to go see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He said, this is horror. And Ridley Scott took that feeling of dread and used it to inform his directing choices in Alien. So you're talking about a movie that had both direct effect in terms of their countless um, countless copycat films for Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but it also contributed to one of the greatest science fiction horror, you know, films ever made, if not the greatest. That's um, amazing. Yeah. So that's anyway, that, so a lot of respect. Terrific. Those three. So I'm talking about three movies there. We might go back, but let's get in. Let's get into you. You got to first of all, we got to shout out those directors for Texas Chainsaw Massacre: Toby Hooper, <laughs> Night of the Living Dead, George A. Romero. Romero, absolutely, what a, a horror master. Yeah, he actually created a monster trope. I mean, just, you know, not that many people. That's the the most recent mo major monster trope I can think of would be the Romero zombie. Yes, he, he absolutely revolutionized what zombies were even considered in cinema because they started out in early Hollywood as mindless, shamblers related to voodoo and haiti right who had been robbed of agency and the whole fear it was a sort of this fear of black power fear of black magic that that someone could control you and be your puppet master zombies weren't running around killing people eating people's brains and 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 uh and that kind of thing but but romero's ghouls he never used the term zombie in night of the living dead his ghouls became the modern zombies we know today. True, and the brain eating uh, actually wasn't introduced until the guy he, let's see, until Return of the Living Dead, which was a completely different movie, which had its tongue firmly in its cheek. Um, it was, but very well done. And I, I think it was Dan O'Bannon involved in that? Was, I uh, forget who was involved in, in that one, but it, was one of the best combinations of horror and comedy that I'd ever seen. But that was where the, you know, that's where the brain thing came from. And and back to Night of the Living Dead, the OG, you cannot underestimate the impact of the casting of Dwayne Jones, a black actor, as the lead character, which I think fed right into societal fears about rising black power in 1967, yeah. 1968, and really accentuated the social messaging that was already present in the film. He, I think he accidentally tripped into a thematic core. You know, it was not intended when he was first doing it. My guess is that when he saw, when Dwayne Jones auditioned for that movie, that was when Romero started to have a sense of what the potentials might be that were different from from what he thought but if you take a look at that movie I'm not sure you could remake that movie today unless you found something else that people were very uncomfortable with perhaps the Dwayne Jones role would be a, a trans man or something like that it's, um, uh, yeah and in terms of how powerful that racial casting was I have not been able to find anyone who knew Romero, who worked with Romero, who collaborated with Romero, who will say anything except Dwayne Jones was the best audition at the time, right? That's the answer. And I believe it. I believe it. Accident. You know, look at the acting of the, some of the other actors. By the way, some of those actors weren't even actors, which is pretty obvious. But in any case, <laughs> when I met Ken Foree, who was in Dawn of the Dead, okay, now listen, you can call the first one an accident. But how are you going to call it an accident? Look, it wasn't an accident after that. After that, he and was he was chasing one. he was chasing the social subtext. Yeah, I mean, anyway. he he realized he'd hit a vein, and he continued to do that uh, in several different movies. I mean, I think that in in one of his movies, uh, Island of the Dead, I think it was was rather unfortunate in that he fell into a trope that that is uh, one of my least favorites, which is all the black characters die. Now, in Night of the Living Dead, it was all right because it was, first of all, it was so revolutionary to have him in the movie in the first place that it, I, what happened to him didn't bother me that much because we'd still had these images. Um, but also because it was apocalyptic in the sense that everybody that you knew died. Everybody mm -hmm. who you'd really met died. There were right, other characters, it. you know, a sheriff, a news you know, a scientist, a news anchor who who survived, plausibly survived the movie, but all the characters that were that were central died, so it was okay. 
but in Island of the Dead, the only black characters they have are just a bunch of heads on pikes. Filmmakers, yeah. please, 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 please pay attention. You know, what's so fascinating to me is that, you know, I, I executive produced Horror Noir on Shudder in 2019, A History of Black Horror, the documentary, where we broke down a lot of these tropes, uh, the sacrificial Negro, the magical Negro, the first to die, a lot of, some of which had actually gone out of fashion and had become sort of fodder for jokes. But with the push for diversity that happened after 2020, they're starting to reemerge like a new generation falling back on the same tropes because they don't have enough black friends. And they to read their scripts and say, no, do not do this. This is such no, you see, so disappointing. I would be less charitable than that. Oh that, my that, goodness. that first of all, the the first to die thing hasn't been true for a generation. That you know, but extinction is killing them all is. Um, but I think that it's not that they don't have any black friends. It's that on some level they they value black lives less. Oh well, absolutely. And it's not at a conscious level, but it's it they're 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 doing it in a way that they feel comfortable with. Then if they a black friend would point it out to them, and once it's up at the conscious level, they say, "Oh God, I didn't mean to do that," you know. But they they're not asking themselves so why did they do that. And just as a little plug, we do consulting for networks and studios. Yes, we do. Subject, and we have done it for some major names. Okay, but let me move on to my list. Please do. Uh, I'm going to look at the first two movies. I think they're the only two that deal with this subject. I'm looking at my list and The Power of Grief. Steve and I have a new graphic novel out, The Keeper. And grief is the underpinning of the story. A young girl who is in grief and her grandmother, who is also in grief, have to come together and, and try to survive. And grief is, is a very common entryway into horror, because as I've probably said on this podcast before, grief is the first time many of us experience horror, uh, losing someone close to us. A dog gets hit by a car as a kid. Oh, there, I mean, that's horror. Well, and, you know, you've talked about uh, transgression as a door into horror as well. No, would, would you differentiate those? No, well, things, transgression is is kind of the old school slashers of the 80s. If you smoked a cigarette or had sex, you were going to die. Mm. And then, of course, you see it in more sophisticated films and stories like The Shining, you know, uh, the alcoholism and child abuse by the father, you know, are the transgression that opened the door to horror. So yeah, there's grief okay. that often will open the door and or and or sometimes people who are in grief also transgress, you know, they're going to get it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that is yeah, unfortunately, sometimes your transgression is having the wrong skin tone. We saw that in a horror movie yesterday. Yeah, we knew that that guy was gonna die just yes. because he you was know, in the wrong skin color. Pretty much everybody died, so that movie is actually on my list. <laughs> oh wait, I took it off. Well, accidentally. Anyway, it's ooh, I might have to mention it later. It's old people on Netflix. <gasps> Whoa, scary. But yes. Uh, okay, so back to grief. The two first movies, one of which many of you may not have seen. This is on Shutter, The Dark and the Wicked. <laughs> it's directed by Brian Bertino. If you've never heard of it and you like your horror grim, served with no chaser, then what's the, the uh, what's the basic setup in that movie? The Dark and the Wicked is basically about two siblings who go to the house of their father because he is very ill. And it's as if the illness either represents, was unleashed by, or was caused by one of the most badass spirits i'm not even going to go into it i don't even want to give anything away about the story that much about it except that it is it's like hereditary level this is this is hardcore grim horror and there are times when that kind of vibe just fits the mood just right it's not as fun as some, watching something like i don't know obviously a horror comedy like Shaun of the dead or even sort of a lighter straightforward horror movie like smile which is also on my list mm. but it is just super 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 grim and there are certain moods when that is just what i want i want a movie that feels like the worst there is that portrays grief as much of a monster as it actually is and the dark and the wicked is well titled and it does that and my second one many of you probably have seen but you haven't seen it recently enough unless you just watched it this year the babadook by jennifer 
um, Kent, the Australian director. This movie, oh, MG, uh, you can see its influence in Smile, I think, uh, to a degree, although mostly Smile is influenced, I think, by uh, It Follows and The Ring, but that's another subject. Um, I'm going to come back to, I'm going to come back to Smile again and again, because it's one of the few movies that's actually in theaters that you can experience right now with an audience. And trust me, you want to do that because it's fun. That's a more fun horror movie. The Dark and the Wicked is not fun. Uh, Babadook, <laughs> I also would say he is not that much fun, but it it gets it right. It gets it right. The, the mother raising a troubled young boy, anyone who has really been a parent, but especially if you had a difficult parenting experience it can get right under your skin you recognize exactly what she's going through and then you understand why because it turns out he was born on the day her husband died so his birth and his birthday are tied up in these deep deep feelings of grief and there is something very nasty loose in their house and that's all i'm gonna say if you've seen it, you know what I mean. If you haven't, then let it unfold. Open it up like a children's book and just experience the story. What are your next ones, honey? Well, are you sure that you, you, did, you did one? I did. I talked about three. So if you'd like to talk about another one, you go right ahead. Okay. Well, I guess since I've mentioned it 800 times already, you know what's ironic? I don't even what? know if I should tell. Am I allowed to tell the story? I don't know if I should tell it, but I'll tell it anyway. Maybe I'll edit it out. <laughs> But we came really close to getting some advertising uh, from the, the Smile Studio. Right? I don't see why you can't say right. it. They, they, were, they were thinking about doing a uh, social media campaign, and we were some of the people they were in talks with about you know how we would talk about it. Listen, this is all free, but it would have been worth a lot of money <laughs> if we were talking about it for pay. Uh, but at some point, they must have realized they had a monster on their hands. It has so far earned 140 million dollars and i guess you just don't need the life writing podcast when you're gonna make that much money <laughs> so we didn't get it but we honestly it's so funny that we would have i mean here's the policy if we ever get paid to talk about movies we would let you know that first of all and second of all we would not talk about movies for pay that we don't actually think are good movies so yeah if it's a bad movie we probably won't, just won't bother to mention yeah. it unless we feel like we have to warn people away from it yeah we've done that but yeah so so i'm not shilling smile because i was paid to rather i almost was but uh it's just the best time i have had in a theater in a long time period Right. It really was just not just because the movie was so much fun. Some people might call, you know, the images rip offery, but it could also just be called homage, you know, to some. Well, I'll tell you one thing. It feels more like J horror, you know, it feels more like oh, Japanese yeah. horror than yeah. American horror in that sure. sense. So if, if it's borrowing some of those images, that's okay. The Japanese have certainly borrowed plenty of images from us. Yeah, I didn't, you know, a lot of people are pointing it out, like say, oh, it's just a mashup of It Follows and The Ring. Like, that's a bad thing. Hello. <laughs> those are two great horror movies. Uh, really, both of those should also be on our list and are not. So let's just throw those in. It Follows and The Ring. If you haven't seen those, why are you even listening to this? Just go watch Well, let's tell a little story about The Ring. We saw The Ring originally not long after it came out in japan uh i managed to get my hands on what must have been a fifth generation videotape videotape did, videotape vhs videotape it didn't even have subtitles on it the, the no, honey, images it did have subtitles but it was so degraded that we could not read the subtitles oh okay is that what i it was? remember it it was an old just just picture an old degraded videotape that's how we watched the ring right and come to think of it, I hadn't it hadn't ever occurred to me because it's a it's a movie about a haunted videotape yes. you're watching on a degraded videotape. Yes. But it, even though we couldn't figure out what people were saying and the images were a little blurry, it was still utterly terrifying. One of you the know? scariest movies I had ever yeah, seen. Yeah, I, I mean, I got it. I got what they were doing. And it was just, it was awful. It was it, just, just, I understand why there have been so many movies based on, I understand why. Even the American version wasn't bad. It wasn't, it wasn't you know, not, 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 not bad. They, they did a pretty, pretty good job. They translated that better than let's say the grudge yeah i think that did the grudge it. didn't work at all in the american no, i don't version. know why it was terrifying in the that's, in the uh the japanese version that's a whole separate and, conversation you know, it, if if you 
respect horror, you probably want to stay away from the movie that they did where uh, the Grudge and the Ring do a mashup. Oh you know, my you know it's it's a comedy sort of, except it isn't, and it's not good, but it's sort of fascinating, like like a slow motion train wreck. Honey, but, you just admitted to all these people that you watched that movie. And yes, I've seen it twice. I actually watched it. I would not have been sitting next to you. <laughs> one of those. I know I didn't see it twice, so you must have watched it once without me. Yeah, I watched it last week. Just wanted to, was it as bad as I thought? Yeah, oh I, it kind of was. Kind of wow. was. Did you hear, this is hardcore horror fandom happening on this podcast. This is, <laughs> you were a witness to a truly remarkable event here today because ring versus the grudge okay yep. i guess that's what we have going here <laughs> who's gonna be the winner okay so you said so, all right so smile was my next one now it's your turn okay so it's my turn um i want to talk about um one movie that's on my list but it's the social context the handmaiden's tale now what disturbed me about the handmaids it's, it's about a world handmaid's of handmaid's tale right handmaid's tale yeah the the uh, women are being tremendously oppressed and forcibly impregnated but what disturbed me even more was that they murdered all the black people more or less mm. off screen and never made any comment about it this is a um, tv series by the no way. no i'm talking about the movie in the oh, book oh there was a movie okay. yes they, there was a book and then there was a movie and they they killed me they they shipped all the black people off to the radioactive wastelands to die and there was no comment about it and i remember watching that movie and listening to the way audiences were reacting to it and what they said about it and nobody ever commented on that that the that the feminist viewpoint about what was going on with the women in there was the focus, which is understandable, but to ignore the fact that they murdered tens of millions of people. Um, and the characters never talked about it. The author never talked about it. None of the critics talked about it. And none of the audience, the, the people who love that book, who consider it to be like a, you know, a Bible of the feminist perspective. It, it, it was utterly horrifying that those lives meant nothing. So I sat there in that didn't theater. Even, didn't even register. It didn't even register. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. And so that was one of the most horrifying experiences I'd ever had, but not because of what was on the screen, but because of the way the audience reacted to it. Mm. You know, that it didn't even matter. It was just a plot point. You know, it was just a plot point. It, it's like it didn't even occur to them. Bye, y'all. That anybody who might be affected by the, the massacre, by the utter genocide, would ever read this book or watch this movie and have a thought about it. You know, so it's like I felt... I felt that was talk about alienation. It's oh my mm. god. Anyway, so that was that's utterly horrifying. But I'm not going to recommend it. You you know you. Uh. Anyway, go ahead. What's your next one? Well, since that's a non recommendation, you should talk about two recommendations. Okay. Well, not necessarily two recommendations, but you know, let's say that that one of the most fun, well done. Um, tra you know, it's tragic, but it's also fun because. Y it, there's plenty of funny stuff in the movie uh, is the fly Cronenberg. Oh, I love uh, that movie. So um, the fly is a genuine romance, uh, mm. you know, between Gina Davis and uh, who's the, who's the male lead? Jeff Goldblum. What and Jeff Goldblum. Say, what? I was literally melting into the memory of how Jeff Goldblum looked when he was in the fly. That was yeah. my jam. I was in yep. college. That was my jam. You know, they, it, it's it's Cronenberg's best body horror film, probably in terms of social in terms of, of social acceptance of it. Um, it's terrifying. It's sexy. It's heartbreaking. Um, it's a lot of different things, you know. And like I said, and when it's funny, it's very funny. Um, and when it gets gooey, it gets very gooey. I mean, there's some nasty, wonderful special makeup effects in that movie. Oh, uh, just next. I mean, so many directors are absolutely channeling the fly when yeah. they do body horror, period. Yeah. Cronenberg's sense of uh, 
one of the most horrifying things in the world is the changes that are going through our body, starting with healthy changes like puberty, no doubt, or pregnancy. You know, a movie like The Brood is dealing with things like that, but also death and age and disease and, ugh, um, you know, sexuality. You know, I think movies like Videodrome, you know, he goes there and he really goes there. So, yeah, The Fly, you know, top marks. What about you? Well, I'm looking at my list and I'm going to group a couple together to talk about. I, I like going back and forth between movies that are classics, but people probably haven't seen recently enough and movies you have not even maybe even heard of when, or haven't seen. So the two of those would also be, I think, somewhat coincidentally on Shutter, Host, which is by Rob Savage, and The Medium, which is a Thai horror film. And the product, the Director's name, forgive my pronunciation, is Ben Jong Pisanthenikon. Okay, so host really quickly. It, it, it dropped during the pandemic when our lives had been reduced to Zoom, and it's a Zoom horror movie, and it's done so well. It's less than an hour, I think. Yeah. It's it's a feature, but it's not a two hour feature, and it is tight. The characters feel real, and that's all you need. I mean, if 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 you, it just drops you into trance because it literally looks like your whole day just looked. Yeah, know? we could easily do a show. Is that the one about the the, the friends who do the the? Yes, yeah, yeah. We could do a show this. about the production of that because what happened? It was done during the pandemic, and um, the it was made by filmmakers, so they had the tools and the talent to do something that went way beyond its minuscule budget. And I mean, even it, it, with the, oh, sorry, go on. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say, even with that minuscule budget, they managed to pull some effects literally out of their butts. Well, that's because they Ooh. had the talent and the tools yes. that, that the people who were acting in it ordinarily would have charged thousands of dollars, many thousands of dollars to do some of the stuff that they were doing for, you know, for giggles. You know, for, for fun. So it it works. It, it has some very, very carefully um, judged special effects that, you know, when they when they come in, it's it's perfect. Uh, but other than that, it's there's nothing on the screen except talent. Oh, you know, just... it, 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 nothing, nothing huge respect for that movie. I think talking about all these movies makes me want to see them again How is oh, the, sure we can do that. gonna go high on my list and also it goes down smooth it's so short it's like you want to watch it and then like immediately watch it with someone else <laughs> you know <laughs> that's how it was for me so that's one and then the medium which again is this is set in thailand and it is about a possession gone wrong that's basically all i'm going to say about it plot wise because those of us who love horror movies know that's all you need okay there's a possession gone wrong but it is documentary style and the thing that works about uh the medium is also something that worked about the ring and also works about all kinds of very specialized, marginalized or different or foreign language or horror. It's because it's coming from a different cultural and mythological sensibility. Like the, the ring freaks and especially the grudge freak us out in part because in Japan, housing and space is so different from the way we use space and housing in the United States. And those camera angles are so unexpected and the mythologies are so new to us. Well, I think that it's unfair. Edge. It's a little bit unfair to say mythologies. It's because it's literally the, their spirituality, you know, Shintoism mm. and so forth. And so um, it has a different relationship between the dead souls and the living souls. Christianity, mm. you know, it has, has, a different is a different tradition and i think that you can actually feel the sincerity that they're exploring something they're showing you a a world view that is not quite our world view and they're doing it with commitment so it is a little disorienting we're you're it's off balance so when in the grudge that little kid's face appears in odd positions yeah. it helps to feed into that sense of i'm i'm not uh I don't know where I am on the map of reality. And yeah. anytime you do that, you fall into the hands of the creator and you have to trust them at that suspension of disbelief. You literally can't, you, you can't get out of the maze 
without their help. So all you're doing is trusting them and in, in, in moving forward. And, uh, and the medium is described as Thai South Korean. So I want to uh, correct that. Okay. Uh, co-written and produced by Na Hong Jin and directed by, as I said, Ban Jong, uh, Pishanun. Oh, Pishan. I should have quit while I was behind the first time. Uh, so sorry, to everyone, literally. Pisanthu Anakun, okay, okay, is this director. And I, I will just say that because it's mockumentary style, which is a great cheat in horror if it's done well, it can also be incredibly tiresome if it's not done well. In fact, the movies I will turn off the fastest are mockumentary style, found footage style, done badly. I'm out five minutes. You better convince me that these are real people and that I give a damn what they're doing. And this movie does that. And it's about, as I said, a possession gone wrong. A lot of my favorite movies on this list are about demons. I make the joke that in a horror movie, if you move into a house, you start hearing strange noises. You find yourself saying, hello? You better hope it's a ghost and not a demon, okay? Because nine out of 10 times, a ghost is just trying to let you know it exists and look what the hell happened to me, okay? That's all they want. A demon will ride your ass for generations, okay? <laughs> when you have a demon on your ass, I believe it was Richard Pryor who said, you truly do have someone on your ass. Yes. <laughs> okay. So this is a demon from a culture I don't know. It's a, a an expression of a demon. I have never seen anything like before. And if you are into demons and you are into getting the crap scared out of you, then do not miss the medium. Cool. Well, you, uh, you embarrassed yourself with a mispronunciation, so I will do the same thing. A director named Pascal Logier. Hmm. Say it with Logier? confidence, baby. Say it with confidence. Logier. I'm going to say Logier. L-A-U-G-I-E-R. And the movie, it's a French movie. It's called Martyrs. And mm -hmm. Martyrs is the most extreme horror movie I've ever seen that I thought was worthwhile. Wow. Um, where I thought to myself that they they had a point to what they were doing. They had a reason for what they were doing. They justified the extreme images. And it's about a woman, or is it two women, it might have been, who escapes from a group of, are they devil worshippers? Something. Who escaped from them years ago and is seeking revenge and to find out what happened to her because some of her memory is, is missing. And let's just say that her, her journey to discover what happened uh, doesn't go well. And what was going on uh, is believable and horrifying. Mm. Uh, so it's, you know, it could actually happen. Oh, um, ooh, those are almost too scary. For yeah, me. yeah. So martyrs, martyrs goes there, but it is for people with a very strong stomach. Wow. Um, yeah. Once you start to cross that line into realism with human horror and the cruelty that people do to each other, that's yeah. tougher for me. It's for the same reason I, I can't deal with true crime. I'm just like, nah, that's not my thing. I yeah, I haven't been able to watch Dahmer yet. Yeah. I've watched one episode. I need that prism of fantasy to distance me from, for, I mean, I, it's the real life horror I'm trying to escape from, as a matter of fact. But but like you said, it's, you know, if you really like it, rough. <laughs> if you like it rough. Yeah, if you like it rough, that'll do. <laughs> um, you know, and I might as well mention another one, you know, before we go on, it's just, you know, let's, it's also rough, but also a huge amount of fun. It's fun horror. Um, it's Car John Carpenter's The Thing. I mean, oh. you know, just... Just I mean, incredible makeup effects. It's fun in retrospect. Acting. <laughs> yeah, fun, fun in retrospect. I mean, once again, it, it's a movie that knows when to use humor to release the tension. But Kurt Russell does such a great job in the lead. And Wilford Brimley, I think that was his very first movie. Uh, same thing with Keith David. His first movie. Uh, his first movie. And um, John Carpenter, if you haven't seen it, John Carpenter recently came out and said that the ending was not ambiguous that there is a very clear clue as to what was going on at the very last scene in that movie uh what you want to do is you want to watch condensation in the breathing but I'll just, that's just all all i will say oh, about that. oh now we have an excuse to rewatch it Can yeah i just tell i have to tell a little story i was 
I was taking part in an event. I went out into LA and I got all glammed up and I did some on camera stuff talking about horror. And I apparently missed my chance to meet John Carpenter Aww. in a green room where we could have actually talked by 15 minutes. That is a shame. Oh, that's a real, real shame. I, I mean, I almost literally, I think I might have cried a real tear when I heard I might have cried. I don't blame tear. you. It was a long day and, you know, it's a big deal to drive all the way out there and, and I don't do it that often. So to know that I was that close to one of the horror idols, I could have just honestly had a chance to let him know what his work has meant to me. And, and he might have said something fascinating. And, you know, just, anyway. I'll well, this is, this is a guy who has created multiple films that are important in this genre. Yes. Actually important. I mean, from, you know, Halloween and the thing and there's actually one more movie on my list it's not important but it's really good let's talk about it now okay the mouth of madness in the mouth of madness mm -hmm. um you know john carpenter it's it's his version of an hp lovecraft uh movie and lovecraft is an is a really interesting case because it's very clear that he was genuinely disturbed in some ways i mean he had had real xenophobia against Asians and black people and, you know, Racism, the, yeah. the, yeah, real, you know, real sense of the outer darkness and, you know, real, apparently some, some really you know, negative sexual attitudes and his work is genuinely disturbing. It really is outsider work. It really is, uh, believing that there are, you know, it's cosmic horror. It's the, it's the idea that there are beings outside our kin and we cannot even understand their motivations we don't even know what they want all we can do is hope we can stay out of their way and so the monsters are generally s stepped down from yog soth -Oth and cthulhu and so forth and so on or they're the they're the half breeds you know like wilbur whateley or or uh the, the story, the, the, the case of Charles Dexter Ward, which is, you know, made into a, a Roger Corman movie, The Haunted Palace, slapping an Edgar Allan Poe title on it, but was about the attempt to, to breed uh, a race of beings that were halfway between these demonic things and human beings. But these demonic things were like fleas on a dog in comparison to what the actual great old ones are. And Mouth of Madness basically has to do with a, uh, uh, a publisher, played by Sam Neill, I think, um, who is trying to chase down a manuscript created by an author who is uh, much like Lovecraft. He's something of an outsider, a cross between Lovecraft and Stephen King. Like a recluse, but, right? Yeah, he's a recluse. And he, in in either his studies or his behavior, he was sort of off the map of reality. And the the publisher is trying to find this guy, and the attempt to find him leads him down some pretty nasty corridors. And it's a it's a solid piece of work. It really is. Wonderful. That was a great that was a great little uh, list. And and I have a few I'm going to group together. Yeah, That's please. My, my last three are black horror you know it's my my thing um it's what i write it's what i create and of course at the top of that list right now would would be get out by jordan yes. peele just if you've seen it only once or twice you haven't seen it enough times <laughs> you totally missed a bunch of stuff so not only would i suggest that you rewatch get out but there's also an annotated screenplay for get out where even if you've seen it six times you're gonna learn about the decisions Jordan Peele made, why he cut this scene, why he added this scene. And just coincidentally, there's an introduction by some hack named Tanana Rebdu. So in any case, I did write the introduction to that. But the annotated screenplay, here's a fun idea. Watch the movie while you read the annotated screenplay. Great tactic for learn for especially if you're a learning screenwriter, you should be doing that a lot. We should be doing that a lot more too. Well, we, yeah, yeah, we we should. But the one of the things I want to start doing on the podcast is giving people specific lessons, specific yeah. assignments, prompts, and the idea of you know get the get the annotated screenplay for Get Out. Let's circle back to it. Let's do it. Let's do it as a part of the wrap, and and yeah. we'll circle back to it. We'll circle um, back. So that is right now just for its influence, for its Oscar-winning screenplay. 
for all the reasons get out is is always on the list for horror movies you gotta watch and rewatch. and i'm going to add some newer work you know because a lot of people may not be aware that there are, are other black horror creators out there who are making inroads and and i think doing very good work one of them you might have seen is on netflix it's his house mm, by Remi- that was Remi- really good it is that was really good it really is it again uh is using Frankly, I'm not going to say all the things, but grief and transgression uh, as a doorway to horror. If you really think about it, uh, it's it's about uh, an African couple who have fled a war-torn uh, nation. I forget where they were from. I apologize for that. But they moved to England and they set up in a flat and it's isolation horror, right? So it, it's too reductive to compare all isolation horror to get out. But a lot of people will do that, right? So this would be the immigrant version of a get out, except it's about a haunted flat and what the haunting means, the origins of it, how it's wrapped up in their past, the groundedness of the storytelling. It, they really convince you that these are real characters and this is a real experience and that's all you need. That's your ticket. If the, if the curtains flutter the wrong way, it's scary if you think it's real. Right. right. So, so, so there's a whole lot going on. You have got to see if you have not seen his house and you like Get Out, what are you waiting for? And also, I would say Master, which is on Amazon, directed by Mariama Diallo. Now, she's a newcomer, and this was a Sundance darling. It's one of two Black horror films that I loved uh, that I saw at Sundance virtually. I will say Master and the upcoming Nanny by Nikki Atujusu, which is just about to come out. I mean, and that's one. One I would have on the list, but it's not out yet. So when Nanny comes out, that's also on my list. Have you seen it? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. I'm so this is why I'm so excited, honey. The state of black horror is very strong right now. And that is really, really encouraging, not just as a as a fan and a viewer and someone who who wants us to win, but as a creator, that means the door stays open just a little longer. You know, let more people in, let more people in. Uh, so yeah, I, the uh, master is, if, you know, the the trite way to say it would be get out on a predominantly white college campus, but it's not. It's 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 isolation horror, told from the point of view of a black faculty member, which resonates with me as a black faculty member at a predominantly white college, and a black freshman. And speaking of which, I have a nephew who is at uh, Grinnell College in Iowa, and there was just a terrible racial incident there where someone spray painted the N-word on 16 cars at the athletic center. And as he was walking alone on the campus back to his dorm, uh, someone yells the N-word at him out of his car at the window. First time it's ever happened to him, by the way, in college. So Master is playing on very real issues. Anyone who's a black faculty member knows how hard it is to progress and how hard it is to bring in other faculty of color, how hard it is to get tidier, all that stuff, all those frustrations, all that history wrapped up in the portraits lining the ivy halls of white men who no doubt would never have wanted you teaching at their campus. You know what I mean? So those are already scaring me those old portraits are already scary to me because I, I couldn't have had coffee when in them but anyway <laughs> in any case it takes the real life trauma and there's enough of the supernatural there's enough mystery i think to give you the emotional distance that it's not re-traumatizing you know it's a very fine line it's a very fine line when it's too real and trust me there are parents who watch this movie master and we're like oh hell no you're not going to you're going to spelman you're going to morehouse you're going to howard because uh no um there's just enough truth you can smell it just enough truth you can smell it but also just enough that's not true that you can relax and and see it as a as fiction and and what all horror is supposed to be entertainment there you go well you know that's a a very strong recommendation at the end and uh, i think that might be a good place a good stopping place this is a good stopping place and this is a good time for us to go into our lesson of the day yes (laughs) you know that's the wrong music i don't mean it to sound we'll find the right music for breaking news but But, anyway (laughs) Look, I mean, it, it, it has to do with one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever heard, that if you want to write scripts, what you should be doing every Saturday night 
is you should be watching a movie while you're reading the script for that movie. So if, if it's a new movie, a movie you haven't seen before, watch the movie once and then watch it a second time and read the script for it. Find the script, download the script, get it from off of Amazon or from your local bookstore. And you want to see, you want to develop the muscle that understands how what's on the page relates to what's on the screen. What's on the screen relates to what's on the page. Doing it that way, if you will do that, if you did that for a year, you would know more about screenwriting than most people coming out of MFA programs. It is the easiest, most fun, and most immediate way to develop your chops. And I cannot recommend it too highly. Yeah, Steve and I uh, lecture about this, but, but too many emerging learning screenwriters believe that they can learn how to write screenplays by watching movies. And there are so many reasons that is not true. <laughs> I There's barely time in this podcast to explain why that's yeah. not true. But a, a script is a template for that movie. That's right. It's a, a script is not a movie. A script is a, is a blueprint for a movie. What you need to know how to write is that document that got that writer paid. Right? Yes. You need to know how to write that document. How to get in the door. In the now door, that... got the credit. If you unleash all of this imagination for for a, a whole crew, literally of people who actually made and your movie. first your first reader, the the director, the person who reads the slush pile or the the producer, you have to not only give them a movie, but you have to kind of entertain them. You know that that you you want them to feel some emotions while they're reading your script. So by reading scripts, um, and looking at how the writer engaged the emotions of the person with the checkbook yeah critical critical thing because it is you're not going to get paid in hollywood based on how well how good you are at writing you're going to be paid in hollywood based on how much emotion you can trigger in the person who makes the buying decision can you sell it it's the marketing and the sales as well as the construction of the art form so, so if you can understand that then you have a chance in the business so absolutely take that advice. Yeah. And that's the they, kind they of out, advice. The get out annotated screenplay is a great start because absolutely. that is an Oscar winning screenplay. Why not read the best? Absolutely. Uh, read this Oscar winning screenplay while you watch Get Out for the fifth or sixth time. It, it'll be worth your while. You'll learn so much as a writer just doing that or, or, or other scripts too. Just do and, that. And that is the kind of advice that you get in the Life Writing Premium program where we, you know, we have taken every wonderful piece of advice that we've ever gotten from other writers and our own perceptions and our own what experiences that's right and created a weekly program that will take you from zero to hero <laughs> oh my god is that our new slogan i don't know about that one but but i think what steve is trying to say is even if you've never published even if you've never published for example that life writing premium is literally a blueprint to help take you from being an unpublished to a published writer. Or if you're already a published writer, but you're not publishing with enough frequency, you're having trouble staying motivated, having a weekly program that motivates you, stimulates you, puts you in the company of other writers on our social media page. That is what life writing premium is. It's for writers of all types. And it includes people who want to write short stories, novels, and screenplays. It's for all of y'all. Absolutely. All of us, I should say. www.lifewritingpremium.com. That's right. www.lifewritingpremium.com. Okay. Well, that's. I think that's it for today, isn't it? It was good. I hope you guys are, were, were taking notes with all those great horror movies. I'll try to have a list of the movies in the podcast description but we were kind of going off the the script so uh there are a lot of movies that won't be there but uh listen to it over and over again if you have to share it with your friends leave a review follow us thank you so much for listening to the life writing podcast and just remember to be the hero or heroine in the adventure of your lifetime bye bye everybody bye bye